Good afternoon. My name is Chaim Yaakobi. I'm the program leader of the Health in Urban Development Master Program at the Development Planning Unit, uh, UCL. And I'm very happy to host today, uh, hopefully and certainly, uh, a very fascinating panel dealing with the COVID-19 crisis in contested cities and divided societies. Um, just before we start, uh, I would like uh, to mention some practicalities. The first one has to do with the chat box. The chat is for people who want to ask questions which are mainly technical. If you have a real question to the panelists, uh, please use the Q&A box. At the end of the panel, uh, we will have, I hope, uh, enough time to answer your questions. We will have to pick some questions. We will not be able to present all questions, but please feel free to share your uh, opinion, your questions in the, in the box. I would also like to mention that this panel is part of a series uh, of the DPU. We, I think this one is the fourth. Next week, as you will see at the end of this uh, session, there is another one uh, that I will uh, give some more details later. So please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, and you know, find the information about all events. Uh, I decided to take quite seriously the question of what kind of future we can imagine uh, in the post-COVID uh, urban context. And I decided, or I was interested, to look at spaces, cities, societies, which are very often under conditions of crisis. So the idea of referring to, to the COVID as a moment of crisis, I would like to question it. I would like to refer to it in a very critical way, uh, since some places uh, all over the world are witnessing an ongoing crisis for years. Uh, and today, our idea is to focus on cities which are the product of ongoing uh, struggle and conflict along ethnic, racial, religious, and class lines. Uh, so the question around what happens when there is a health crisis, such as uh, in the case of uh, Belfast, Cape Town, Jerusalem, or Nicosia, is a very important question that I would like uh, our panelists to share with us uh, their experience as both researchers, but also as people who live in these cities. I will present the panelists uh, later. The issue of health or the crisis around health is obviously important, but what I hope to hear more from our panelists today is how the current situation, how it is, um, or how it should be understood in relation to the ongoing unequal uh, distribution of urban services in general, but health services in particular in these cities. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, the idea of referring to urban health is an ongoing project at the Development Planning Unit including our uh, new master, uh, which is, you know, to, this year is the first year of this master, and suddenly we have the, the, the COVID, uh, which help us, you know, very much to focus on the necessity to refer to urban health justice as an urgent matter that should be discussed these days and now. I think that what I will do, uh, I will present uh, the speakers one by one, uh, and I would like to start with a very dear colleague, uh, Dr. Rania Kolkotroni, uh, who is an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Primary Care and Population Health at the University of Nicosia at the medical school. Rania is also uh, a very, uh, you know, an outstanding partner 
in our project uh, at, the, at the Health and Urban Development Master Program. Uh, so we know each other for a period of time. Uh, so Rania, I think you will start and then I will present the other speakers. Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, thank you, Chaim, for your kind words and, uh, and for the invitation to participate in, uh, in this session today. It's really um, an honor for me to be with everybody here and uh, share with the, them our experience in Nicosia on how we've been doing with the, uh, how we've been dealing with the COVID situation and how it has affected our um, society. Um, just to kind of give people an overview of, of the COVID situation, uh, we've, we've had our first case on the 9th of March and uh, since then, um, we've, since the 15th of March, we've been in complete lockdown. Uh, so completely uh, in our houses um, with uh, only the necessary services uh, in place like health services, uh, um, pharmacies, supermarkets, and so forth. We've been doing quite well uh, in uh, restricting the, um, the, the virus in our society. Uh, we've only uh, had uh, 15 deaths. So this is 12 per million uh, population, which is, I think, one of the lowest in, in Europe. Uh, we've, uh, we've done aggressive testing uh, within our community um, and so far we had 874 cases. Um, so in this graph we're just showing that our peak in, in terms of the number of cases has been sometime uh, in, in early April. We are here now, we only had two cases reported yesterday and in terms of our, uh, this is our admissions to hospital, again these are very low, we currently only have 13 uh, people in the hospital and about three in ICU um, and these are the number of tests so we've been dealing with it quite um, well um, there is a platform of another university that is actually showing um, some data in relation to other countries as well and um, as I said we've been uh, uh, very aggressive in terms of tests you see that we are third in Europe in terms of testing um, and we've done very well as I said in terms of deaths now, um, you probably all know that uh, Cyprus is a divided country and Nicosia is a divided city uh, since 1974 when uh, Turkey um, and the two communities, the Turkish Cypriot community now live in the north and the Greek Cypriot community lives in the south. And uh, in 2000, and we've been in complete isolation since uh, 2003 when uh, a, a, a couple of checkpoints were opened and we were allowed to visit um, each, each, each of the communities to visit the other community. That was in 2003. And, and since then, the number of checkpoints increased. Um, and uh, on, uh, when the COVID situation started, um, the government decided to close some of these checkpoints. Uh, that, that's the, gov the government of the Republic of Cyprus. So um, that, um, the, the government uh, thought that there was a temporary measure uh, to protect, protect against the coronavirus spread between the, the two communities. Um, and uh, however, though, it, was, um, it wasn't taken very well from uh, a number of people in, in Cyprus. Uh, the Turkish Cypriot uh, leader, and uh, uh, thought that uh, accused the government that uh, they had ulterior motives and also the left-wing opposition of the Greek Cypriot community said the same. Um, some other uh, people who are um, from the Turkish Cypriot side who are opposing uh, Turkey's occupation uh, thought that the closure of the checkpoints had to do with uh, the refugee crisis in, in Turkey, that uh, the Republic of Cyprus decided to close um, the, the checkpoints because of that. So um, the closing of the checkpoints, although the government was insisting that it was uh, down to uh, scientific evidence that they needed to limit um, reduce the, uh, the contact between the two communities. Um, it led to a big dispute uh, and a protest was organized by peace activists from both communities uh, on the 7th of March, demanding the reopening of the, of the checkpoints. Uh, 
the United Nations expressed concern uh, about the disruption that was caused by the uh, by this event, uh, by the closing of the checkpoints, but also by this event of the uh, protest and. Um, uh, and and there was and that day it was a it, it was a difficult day for the police uh, when people tried to uh, join the two communities again. Um, but uh, because uh, we had soon our first case announced, both in the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot uh, community, uh, then the Tur it was the Turkish that decided to close all the borders and close all the checkpoints. And that kind of uh, led to an end, uh, for a, a temporary uh, end in, in the dispute, uh, which kind of uh, started again um, sometime a, a month later when the two leaders of the community decided to help each other in this crisis. And uh, the Greek Cypriot community decided to provide some medical um, some uh, medical uh, staff to the to the Turkish Cypriot community who were uh, who did not have enough pills and protective equipment, and um, this was actually uh, a decision that was taken uh, was popular among the Greek Cypriots, um, and it was very popular among the Turkish Cypriots. But not all. The Turkish Cypriot Prime Minister was not happy about it. Um, thought that uh, it was illegal that uh, the um, Greek, the Turkish Cypriot community leader accepted this help, and thought that uh, he, uh, that they should be only allowing uh, um, help, accepting help from Turkey. So, um, despite the fact that uh, we should have been a little bit closer to be uh, to be together in this crisis. Uh, unfortunately, the events uh, and the decisions that were taken by the by the leaders of the communities, by, they were not taken, um, um, they were not seen in the same light by people uh, in the com in the communities. Uh, so we had the more um, extremist community looking. Uh, at the measures and thinking that uh, there were ulterior motives to whatever people were doing. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I just wanted to touch upon the, the religious debate. We also had the closing of the churches the, uh, after the, the first case of coronavirus. Uh, actually, the, um, the government and the Church of Cyprus collaborated very well in this effort. Um, and uh, the uh, leader of the Church of Cyprus uh, said that they would do anything to uh, stop the virus and, uh, and they were happy for, to stop the operation of the churches. Um, however, you can understand that this was the, the time when it was Easter uh, for the, for the um, uh, Greek Orthodox, and it was a difficult time for people who are very religious and not to be away from, from their churches. Um, so then a big debate started um, about whether we should be opening the churches. We had health professionals say that we should do providing scientific evidence that, uh, uh, the, the, that if we should um, having the same measures within the churches as we had for supermarkets and that the Holy Communion is not a, a means of transmission of the virus. And again, there was a big debate between the, the, the people who are very religious and the, and the um, and other health um, professionals and scientists and the Cyprus Medical Association in opposing uh, the opening of the churches. Um, and last thing I wanted to say that one of the other struggles were, were the refugees. Um, the vulnerable people in this situation, there were huge gaps in dealing with the vulnerable in, in this situation. Um, and the refugees is one of the uh, groups of people. We had lots of people arriving in Cyprus uh, the months before. Um, I think at this point we are probably the uh, country in Europe that has received the most refugees in proportion to our population and our services were already struggling with it. So imagine with all uh, the coronavirus situation, things became worse. I think um, they did our best in keeping the, uh, the refugees informed. If you see here, there were announcements uh, that were translated in different languages, uh, advice on how to protect themselves again in different languages, and a lot 
lot of uh, voluntary work was done um, by uh, refugee support um, NGOs to providing help to the refugee communities in terms of food and anything else. Um, the healthcare again um, was one of the things that was uh, um, uh, one of the things that we struggled, uh, but um, I think uh, uh, was provided for the refugees who wanted uh, to um, seek for help. But the problem is that we have a lot of people who are not registered as asylum seekers in Cyprus, but remain in Cyprus, and these people, we don't know whether they've had access to health care. Um, and the only thing we know is that we didn't have a big outbreak in these populations. And um, the other thing to consider is that these people now are stranded in Cyprus. They want to go somewhere else, but they cannot. And the last thing, and I will end with this, is that uh, today, as I was preparing for this presentation, I saw that the refugees in refugee camps uh, have gone on a strike, hunger strike today. Uh, because of the uh, lockdown measures, uh, their key message is freedom is key. And I think this is something that is not only uh, their conclusion, it's the conclusion of the whole society in Cyprus because everybody has felt that their freedom was limited during the lockdown period and it has affected um, the way that we appreciate uh, the fact that we have democracy in this country. So that's, that's, uh, that's actually the freedom is key. This is where they put it outside one of the refugee camps uh, today. Um, and uh, I would like to thank you again for uh, inviting me to this session. This is in Greek. Uh, it says, all together we will make it. Uh, hashtag we will make it and this is the uh, the slogan that our government had uh, in order to fight this uh, pandemic so thank you thank you very much urania uh that was a very interesting uh, uh presentation and i think you know the notion of crossing borders and boundaries in mm. cities in divided cities or contested cities these days will certainly uh, be expressed in, in, in the other speaker's mm -hmm. presentation. Uh, and now uh, we will move to uh, Andy, Dr. Andy Tucker. Uh, Andy is an associate professor and the deputy director of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. Uh, I mean, I can familiar with your work, Andy, on, I would say, the geography of health. Uh, and that's how we, we, we had the first contact. So I'll be very, very uh, happy to hear what you have to say today. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for the invite to uh, take part in this. Uh, it's a really exciting session. And I found that there were some very interesting um, points about the Cyprus example, for example, in the way that um, that they've been shown to be somewhat of a success in terms of managing cases. That's also something that I want to touch on in relation to Cape Town. So what I want to talk about is Cape Town's and also wider South Africa's COVID-19 response and the sometimes conflicting and complex implications of the response. Um, the first thing to say is that the consequences of responses to COVID-19 in South Africa as a whole and Cape Town in particular are clearly shaped by the country's spatial inequalities tied to past histories of racial discrimination. Now that's both through colonialism and through apartheid. Yet it's important to appreciate that there is significant complexity in the ways in which these past conflicts today play out in relation to COVID-19, and the ways in which they are manifest in different urban environments across South Africa, with a particular focus in this talk on Cape Town. So in this talk, I want to highlight three key complexities. The first is successes that have tried to take account of past histories of racial discrimination. The second is challenges in the urban fabric that make one dimensional policy prescriptions difficult to implement. And the third is just to step back and think about how discursively and through different policy registers, South Africa has witnessed to dual imperatives to universalize risks and also to materially specify differential risks based on different geographies. So the first point is just successes. So South Africa um, entered into lockdown quite early in its epidemiological curve. We've been in lockdown now 
for uh, nearly six weeks. Uh, restrictions have slightly lifted in the past few days, but it's still pretty much a lockdown, uh, most certainly by European standards. Um, what's happened because this lockdown happened so quickly and so decisively um, is that infections of COVID-19 have remained relatively small for a country with about 56, 57 million people. In Cape Town, as of yesterday, there were 3,015 cases, and Cape Town's got a population of about 4.5 million. Nationally, there are just over 7,000 cases, and a quarter of a million tests have been done. What's interesting about these tests, though, and I think that this is some, somewhat similar, perhaps, to the um, Cyprus example, but very different, I think, to many locations in the global north, is that these are active testings. These aren't passive tests where people feel ill and then go and present themselves at a clinic for uh, screening. Um, in South Africa, there are about 28,000 community healthcare workers going into the most vulnerable communities in South Africa to test people, to then do contact tracing, hotspot identification, and if necessary, quarantine those individuals. And this was largely precipitated by a realization on the part of governance officials and policy experts that there was a very high risk that if the pandemic spread into informal settlements or into former township locations, um, you could end up with a very significant pandemic indeed. And what we're seeing so far is that that just simply hasn't been the case in South Africa. The next thing I just want to touch on is uh, a, a particular Cape Town example, which are called the Cape Town Community Action Networks or CANs. Now these are, or, or rather, these have emerged as a rapid community response to COVID-19 from across the city. And they're based on the idea that everyone in the city is connected to everyone else, and they're driven very much by a sense of solidarity. Um, there are cans in formalized parts of the city, and there are cans in former townships, for example, in places like Kailicha. Uh, the idea is that individuals can join a can, and they can work to support particular community needs in the location where they live but they can also reach out across the city and span spatial divides to support CANs in other parts of the city as well. And these CANs have been involved in all kinds of different activities, such as mapping vulnerable people, setting up hand washing stations, or tracking and trying to address the fact that some informal settlements don't have running water. So I think this is also a reflection in, in, in perhaps a more positive way of the legacy of apartheid, because South Africa has always had a very vibrant civil society sector. And I think we can see the community response in relation to COVID-19 as also emblematic of that strong civil society engagement. But moving on to challenges, there's really two I want to surface here, although there are many more. Um, the two I wanna focus on are informal settlements themselves and the informal economy. So informal settlements um, have a very high uh, population density, which makes social distancing a significant challenge. In South Africa, generally, it's estimated that somewhere around about 20% of individuals live in informal settlements. And in Cape Town, there's close to 150,000 households living in informal settlements with high population densities. Now, as recent work by Leslie Gibson and David Rush has pointed out, where they've done some GIS analysis of informal settlements in Cape Town and considered that in relation to COVID-19, it's basically impossible for lots of these informal settlements to be put, for the residents of those settlements to be able to engage in social distancing. Now, that also creates a significant challenge when talking about a lockdown and one of the most stringent lockdowns in the world where if people don't have access to running water themselves, and if they don't have their own toilet facilities but are using shared toilet facilities, when they go and access those services, they're actually in effect breaking social distancing and hence breaking the lockdown regulations. So this is one of the reasons why South Africa has had to implement such wide scale active testing to try and mitigate against this. But in terms of the informal economy as well, I mean, the lockdown was so rigid that um, the informal sector stopped when the lockdown started, pretty much. Informal construction workers, taxi drivers, street vendors, for example, have all been unable to work. Now, this has particular health implications in the context of nutrition security and food security. The reason for this is that if you stop people from being able to work, particularly people in vulnerable sectors of society, then they're not gonna be able to afford food. 
they're unlikely to have significant financial resources in reserve to be able to buy food when they're not working. And this was made more complex in South Africa because the lockdown initially when it was put in place shut down unregistered spaza shops or corner shops and also street vendors of food. Now, these informal spaza shops and street vendors were very important to people who exist in the informal economy and generally people in lower socioeconomic groups because at these venues, you can buy food in smaller portions and you can also um, um, buy food that supermarkets would consider to be seconds or not good enough to sell in an actual supermarket. So with those venues being closed down and with um, people in the informal economy not being able to afford food in the formal economy in formal supermarkets, then the realities of food insecurity became very apparent in South Africa. Now, what should be pointed out is that some of my colleagues at the African Centre for Cities, such as Gareth Haysom and Jane Battersby, worked very closely um, with the state to relax some of those regulations so that some informal street traders could actually start trading again. But what this point really shows is that while the state has been successful at stemming COVID-19 incidence rates, it's done so in ways that at times have struggled to take account of long-standing social spatial inequalities across South African cities. And this is just a picture of an article that some colleagues of mine wrote. And um, what's interesting, I think, is actually the picture that goes with it, just so that everyone can see. This is an example of street traders selling fresh fruit and vegetables um, by a street side and, and, and how you know, this was pretty much made illegal by the state for a short period because of the very stringent lockdown regulations. So the last thing I wanna to touch on is this um, complex dance that the South African state and governance officials have to take where they have to both simultaneously universalize discourses of risk and also specify geographic variability in terms of risk. Now, on the one hand, in terms of universalizing risk, South African politicians have been at pains to point out that everyone in South Africa is at risk of contracting and passing on COVID-19. Now, the reasons for this become quite clear when you look at some of the original discourses that emerged um, among some sectors of South African society regarding who was actually at risk. The very first cases um, in South Africa were among um, white middle-class tourists who had gone to Europe and particularly to Italy on skiing trips and hiking holidays, and then they brought the virus back to South Africa with them. So the argument was that COVID-19 was actually a white middle-class problem because after all, it's that group that are most likely to want to go on holiday in March to Italy. So this need to actually try and undercut that narrative and point out universal risk becomes apparent. But also at the same time, South Africa has been acutely aware of the need to specify different types of risk. If we stick with the example of the middle classes for a, um, a moment longer, we can also see that it's the middle classes who are most likely to be able to still keep working during the lockdown. It's people that can appear on webinars. It's people that can afford to go to supermarkets. It's people that have the capacity to social distance because the urban fabric in which they live allows for it. So this need to take account of differential risk is also something that the South African state and the city of Cape Town has been very aware of. And we can see that, for example, in the instance of active testing and the drive to do that in targeted communities across South Africa. But then also we can see how in other instances, this drive to specify risk, this drive to understand geographic variability has sometimes been challenging. And I think that the clearest example of that is how you have a universalizing lockdown applied to the unequalness of informal settlements and the implications that that clearly has in terms of social distancing, and as I've mentioned in this talk, uh, food security. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Thank you. Great, Andy. Many, many thanks. I think uh, um, I would like to mention to, to our attendees that the Q&A box is open for your questions. And that so far, you know, we have a constant number of 232 participants, which is really great. So uh, keep asking questions. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I would say, old friend, not because we are old, Rami, uh, 
but uh, Dr. Rami Nasrallah is an old friend and colleague from East Jerusalem. Uh, Rami is the director of uh, the IPCC, the International Peace and Cooperation Center in East Jerusalem, and he's also the co-founder of the Jerusalem Urban Research Institute, uh, a new body at the Al-Najjah University in Nablus, Palestine, that we hope at UCL to develop uh, more academic and professional contact with. So Rami, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chaim. Thank you for the, this chance to talk to you and uh, to talk about this issue at this uh, tough uh, period. When we talk about East Jerusalem, uh, it's become more or less uh, the, uh, the gray area which totally isolated uh, from the Palestinian Authority and from Israel at the same time. I mean, what I mean, uh, since uh, this uh, COVID-19 started and the Palestinian Authority, in fact, they had very uh, efficient measures that they took at early, at a very early stage, I'm talking about early uh, March, the uh, lockdown of the uh, Palestinian towns, it happened at early stage. Jerusalem was totally out of uh, the uh, Palestinian context at that time, and definitely uh, uh, at the uh, Israeli level, uh, Palestinian uh, activists start to uh, organize themselves to link with the uh, Palestinian civil society organizations and the health organizations in the West Bank uh, to be engaged in an awareness uh, in uh, disinfection uh, activities, but they were all arrested, especially in the old city of Jerusalem. At that time, there was no cases, there was no infections, though about early uh, March, but they still, they were arrested because they were violating the Israeli sovereignty uh, by uh, having activities related to the Palestinian Authority, which is not the case. I mean, it's definitely a grassroots uh, movement. If we talk about the figures, I mean, until, uh, I will say until uh, mid of March, there was no testing at all in East Jerusalem uh, and following the Adala, which is a Palestinian uh, human rights organization in Israel, Supreme Court petition, Israel opened uh, uh, the testing center uh, in East Jerusalem, especially in the neighborhood of Kufr Aqab and Shafat. They are the, the two enclave located within uh, municipal uh, uh, Jerusalem under the Israeli jurisdiction, but they're still cut by the separation wall. Uh, more than 140,000 people living there in a very high dense areas, especially the Shafat refugee camp area, where in 200 square meter, there's more than 30,000 people living. So you can imagine the density in, in this refugee camp. Uh, later on, the Palestinian Authority, through the network of the Palestinian hospitals, we talk about seven hospitals in each Jerusalem, they start to be active. These are hospitals, uh, semi-private, semi, I would say semi-public, uh, part of them under the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Palestinian, I would say, uh, Ministry of Health, in an indirect way, some of them under honor war, like the Augusta Victoria, and others are, are uh, semi-private uh, uh, hospitals. They were all get into one task force, uh, trying to help into this and to establish a testing center in the French hospital in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, uh, if we talk about the numbers, and no one really knows the, the numbers because until two weeks ago, the Israeli Ministry of Health was not publishing anything related to the, uh, uh, to, to the cases, uh, infection in each Jerusalem. And actually, there is no tracking until today of people who were infected uh, or tested. They, there's no data about it. You cannot track any Palestinian in each Jerusalem. If you look at the GIS of the Israeli Ministry of uh, Health, each Jerusalem does not exist. All settlements there, but Palestinian each Jerusalem is not there at all. The Palestinian, uh, Palestinian Ministry of Local Government start also to track the cases, um, uh, I would say in, in, in the last four weeks. Uh, if we talk about the numbers, the, uh, the number of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who are infected, it's, uh, it's still a very small number, 520, uh, 413 still what they call the active cases. And among this, 260 cases, they were from the, uh, the Jerusalem governorate, which is the city of Jerusalem with 150 cases infected, 
people and uh, the uh, uh, the governor uh, the villages around uh, the city so we talk about 63% of infected palestinians in the west bank coming from jerusalem uh, the uh, palestinian authority claimed that 97% of infected uh, infections they were coming from labor in israel most of those who were infected in East Jerusalem, they were in neighborhoods where they have a very high employ, uh, employment in Israel. Uh, we talk about uh, slum neighborhoods, uh, poor neighborhoods, high dense, high dense neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. Uh, the second stage for the Israeli imposing its sovereignty on uh, the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 virus, by 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 by. Uh, preventing the Palestinians from taking any any uh, preventive action against this is to arrest the minister of Jerusalem and the governor of Jerusalem and to warn them to have any contact with anyone in Jerusalem uh, and and they, they were uh, like you know uh, under home uh, uh, arrest for 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 at least two weeks and by then uh, by that time I mean they were talking about uh, you know mid March uh, uh, a new uh, approach, more pragmatic, uh, which is the uh, civil coalition for Palestinian rights in Jerusalem, which is like a, 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 a left right wing, uh, sorry, a left uh, wing uh, uh, Palestinian uh, NGOs uh, related ma mainly to the uh, uh, to the popular party, which is the former Communist Party and the uh, the Popular Front. They they were engaged. Also in, in uh, with Adala for this uh, petition and, and taking a lead into uh, helping and supporting the Palestinian uh, people. The uh, the one successful initiative is the uh, the uh, a task force uh, in cooperation between the network of the hospitals in East Jerusalem and the private sector, where they uh, allocated a, 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 a quarantine hotel hotel in East Jerusalem. The only one Israel didn't take any measure at, until now. This is only a Palestinian hosp uh, hotel, uh, hotel which start to receive even cases uh, directed by the Israeli uh, Ministry uh, uh, of uh, Health. They didn't know about it at all. So it is, uh, again, the uh, initiative of the community. I would say uh, that this, this uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, it will affect the way the Israeli stab, I mean, the way the Israeli establishment perceive Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Until uh, uh, the day before, uh, uh, it, it, the Israeli authorities prevented any Palestinian uh, function have to do with national symbols, with the attachment to the Palestinian Authority. And it is also a weird uh, definition if we, uh, as a Palestinian Jerusalemite, are not connected with the Palestinians in the West Bank with whom we should be connected. I mean, we are not connected to anyone. So, uh, meaning we are totally uh, uh, cut from, from our hinterland and from our uh, social, economic, political, uh, economic uh, functions in the West Bank. The fact that each Jerusalem was the metropolitan hub, the center for, for, for the Palestinian West Bank and Gaza until Oslo, and mainly until the, uh, uh, the wall was constructed in 2002, does not change this reality that this, this East Jerusalem is the urban zone of Palestine. There's no one can take this from, from East Jerusalem, and it is the largest Palestinian city. The, the uh, turning point that Israel now starts to Im Im impose its sovereignty on the people, not just on the uh, symbols of the Israeli, uh, uh, the, 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 I would say the political symbols of, let me put it this way. The, uh, what concerned the Israelis was the, uh, that there's no other Palestinian sovereign uh, symbols could appear uh, in Jerusalem, like the flag, like festivals, like culture, like uh, you know, folklore, uh, dance, etc. They prevented this, including art, including uh, student uh, 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 celebrations. Today, they are preventing the uh, voluntary work of grassroots organization at neighborhood level because they should not do it. The one who should do it uh, should be, uh, uh, the, uh, and the one who were only allowed to do it is the community centers under the Israeli municipality. They created some youth organization uh, based on the Israeli law. 
on the Israeli, uh, sorry, on the Israeli, on the, on the Israeli government uh, decision in 2018, in May 2018, to bridge the gap between East and West Jerusalem. So they created some community centers, some semi-civil society, but totally loyal, totally financed by Israel. These groups were the only one allowed to function in East Jerusalem, meaning that they are blocking, preventing, uh, not just restricting, they are totally preventing Palestinian civil society from taking any part in fighting the COVID-19, in taking any uh, uh, steps. We're still talking about a, a small number in, in, in the Israeli context, but we talk about 63% of the total Palestine uh, uh, figures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Rami. Uh, I think you know the issue of sovereignty and control in, uh, in, in, in colonial conditions came very, very clearly in your uh, presentation. Now I would like to move to uh, Professor Dominic Bryan. Uh, Dominic is an anthropologist, and I think it is important to mention that the selection of speakers has to do also with what we believe uh, is important to have a look at health issues from a very interdisciplinary uh, uh, perspective. So we have uh, Remy, who is a public health expert, mm -hmm. uh, and you is a geographer, Rami, who is a planner, and now we have uh, uh, Dominique from the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, invite. It's a uh, it's a privilege to take part in uh, events uh, events like this. I'm going to try and share my screen, and hopefully, um, hopefully that'll come up for everybody. Okay. Um, so let me very quickly say um, that is that shared. There we go. Uh, let me very quickly say that um, uh, Northern Ireland, as part of the United Kingdom's uh, response, has had a relatively high number of cases. I think compared with um, uh, compared with uh, Cyprus, for example, and South Africa, I think it would probably be high. We've had 387 deaths and about 1,800 um, uh, uh, people who've, who, who've caught COVID. However, within the UK, I would say we were quite low. Um, we have had a fairly strict uh, lockdown and are still in a, a, a fairly strict lockdown. Um, so what I, what I wanted to try and do is to try and give a, a, an estimate of where I think we are using a few anthropological tools. Um, uh, I think it, um, and this I should say is just my own interpretation of what I'm seeing at the moment. These are the various earliest days. Um, some of the pictures I'm going to show you at the moment involve a cycle ride uh, done two hours ago uh, for my exercise. And you'll see what I mean. Um, you'll see what I mean in a moment. So let me give you a very, some very brief background um, that you'll know about Belfast, which is sort of capital city of Northern Ireland. You'll know that our conflict exists between a dispute over whether six counties in the north are a part of the <clears throat> United Kingdom or a part of the Republic of Ireland. I'll come back to some of that in a moment. <clears throat> I would count it as an ethno-political conflict, but one which has had a significant peace process over two decades, which with a lot of money thrown at it, which I think is quite important, and I'll, and I'll um, mention that, meaning that uh, I was very interested in what Andrew said about the role of civic society. I, I'm going to suggest that we have got a very quite a powerful uh, a civic society with a good deal of resilience. And I'm going to suggest that maybe that, that, that has been quite, quite helpful. I'll come back to that in a minute as, as well. But I, I was interested what, about what Andrew said about that. We nevertheless remain a deeply divided society. Uh, areas of Belfast are divided geographically into nationalist and unionist, particularly the poorer working class areas. I live in North Belfast, um, which is the third poorest constituency in the United Kingdom. West Belfast is the first poorest, most poorest constituency in, in, um, in the United Kingdom. We're deeply divided residentially. We have a school systems which are separate. We have walls which divide communities. 
uh, and as and strong senses of territory. However, that peace process also seen pol policies of integration, large amounts of money put into the community sector, uh, uh, areas of shared space, and public funding and services, which has been a real effort to offer equally. So we access unlike some of the other case studies we're looking for, I'd say our access is fair. You know, our biggest hospital, the Royal Hospital, sits in a, an area of Catholic West Belfast, for example, as a, as a, as a way of, of, of looking at it. Um, we have continued low levels of political violence, um, uh, but we do have a society with a large number of NGOs and, and, and civic society. So I would say we have quite high levels of social capital, and I'll come back to why that's important in a minute. Um, we have economic problems, significant ones in Belfast, but we also have the relatively uh, a large uh, uh, economy of the UK uh, that throws money at us in all sorts of ways as well. And we have a national health service, and that will come significant in a minute. Um, so there's much that separates the two what people call communities. Uh, in, in Northern Ireland, the, the, the nationalist Catholic one uh, and the unionist Protestant uh, one. But of course, uh, COVID has that in that sense not discriminated against it. And also those two communities these days are both involved in the big, in the in frontline services like the National Health Service. So, so it's not as if in, in, the, in the policing of this dispute, as it were, of, of this crisis, um, uh, people are joined together in trying to support that the health service. So my initial observations are this. Um, so, so the social capital, the social services within working class areas have reacted very quickly and they've reacted um, uh, t together. So there's been, there's been cross, what we would call cross community work on this. Um, there's a downside to this. I'll come to, to that in a minute. Um, neighborhoods are very well served with community groups and clubs. I've been amazed at how local clubs, societies have all got together. We've got local soup kitchens. Uh, there's been quite a deal of social networking to, to, to deal with the lockdown situation in, in, in the poorer working, working class areas of, of, of Belfast. And as I said, there's some evidence of some good cross community working. And that's because in peace building, there has been relatively good networks uh, set up. Um, uh, and people have felt engaged in what I would say was a common effort to try and to, to try and deal with it. And I'll come back to that word effort in a minute as well. Um, and really, that's because there is widespread, widespread support for a National Health Service. So even even people who are from a, a nationalist or Irish Republican background recognize the importance of the National Health Service. And a lot of them, it would be one of the things within the United Kingdom that they would rate very highly and sometimes be critical of the Republic of Ireland as not having a, a power. So the National Health Service of anything you could find is quite a uniting, uh, a uniting idea here. And it builds upon the general values of neighborhood neighborliness and public service that you, you get over here. All right. So how has this played out in the way people are behaving and what they're doing? Well, first of all, very interestingly, like a lot of areas in Europe, we've developed some ritual ways of expressing our sense of being in this together. So on Thursday evenings at eight o'clock, we all go out and clap and support people working for the National Health Service and other frontline services. And we've all done this as, as, as neighbours and we've waved at each other and we've chatted and we've sang and we've done things like this. And this, have, this has taken place increasingly, uh, importantly, through in both Protestant and Catholic communities. All right. So this has been a joint ritual, which is sometimes unusual. It builds upon a sense of neighbourhoodliness. It, 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 it's interesting. I'm trying to, trying to work out how much we've copied this from Spain and Italy and other places. Um, this hasn't been universal. Everybody on my street doesn't come out, but a lot of people do. All right. And they do so in both ethno-political groups. We've also had the development of this symbol of the rainbow, which signifies supporting the National Health Service. It seemed to start in London in a strange sort of way. I won't go into the details. All right. But it's been displayed. People have been putting up in their houses uh, all the windows in both nationalist and unionist areas 
all right it's been a common symbol it's been used by public services our, our local public services are using it as a symbol so so that the use of it is coming from the top in terms of adverts and from a ground level my kids have been painting them on stones leaving them around the, the, the local area all right so it has official and unofficial support again it's not universal not everybody's doing but it's pretty widespread so where do the issues come in well I think the most interesting is the way that the fight against the conflict when it's depicted as war. So it's depicted as a struggle of the nation, in this sense, the British nation, the United Kingdom, against this. And the minute you start down those sort of narratives, as I'll show in pictures at the moment, you, you have issues which divide here because Republicans, nationalists, Irish nationalists, find that very understandably very little difficult to go along with so as there's been quite a bit of writing on this already the use of war and militaristic narratives has become popular with unionists and i'll show you the pictures at the moment but absent in nationalist areas and and in unionist areas it's been linked with vae day uh, victory in europe day which the 75th anniversary comes up with the uh, 8th of may but also this quite wonderful ex-british soldier 100 years old colonel tom moore who raised 30 million pounds walking up and down his garden but uh, and, and i know i'm not trying to pretend that the, the militarism is some you know he happened to be an army uh, uh, become an army colonel but the way it's been linked in in pictures of course has influences over here all right and and it does mean that there's been a uk and irish political agenda so to to, to, to finish off let me show you it, it, if you like and these these pictures come from both nationalist and unionist areas pictures of the rainbow pictures of being in it together pictures of heroic uh, being heroic so the one at the top right hand comes from the Ardoin which is a which is a, a, a Republican area just near me the one over on the left comes from a loyalist areas and you can see the use of this uh, as being in it together on the other hand there's also a narrative using the Union flag using sense of Britishness uh, the National Health Service being being uh, depicted as being a, a British uh, service. And you can see links with military, even the, even the use of that American image of raising the flag over in the, the top left seems to. So, so this narrative is also taking place uh, at the same time. And the most distinctive one was a banner that's gone up locally. The, the phrase no surrender is one used by loyalists uh, historically and becomes very important. So the fight against COVID in that area is linked by a marching band to, um, to the idea of not surrendering. Right. So what are my conclusions? Um, I think there's been significant impact in terms of social cohesion across the community and, and communities across communities have acted very well. So, so going back to what Andrew was saying, I, th I think our peace building, our social capital out of that has potentially served us very well. I'm, I'm, it's early work days at looking at it, but I think it has. And, and there's also been significant common purpose in the political field where nationalists and unionists have worked together. And the narratives in the two communities, which are, can be very ge geographically separated, have a lot of similarities. So the, there is something taking place there. And this is really because support for the NHS, the National Health Service, is almost universal. Nevertheless, there are nationalistic and commemorative rhetorics, which I think are going to play themselves out in the future, which will create co uh, complexes. Uh, complexities to that. I'm very interested in the way that National Health Service nurses and doctors are depicted as soldiers and this has happened in the UK generally and the way that that's going to play itself out uh, in the future and it certainly creates a, divi a division in, uh, in Belfast and, and Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much Dominic. I think it was a fascinating uh, presentation. If you can just unshare your screen, perfect. Uh, you know, we have many questions and we don't have the time for all of them. So I really apologize for those, you know, maybe in the future we can have another meeting. Uh, but I would like to pose maybe two questions to the panel, to all members. I don't think we will have time for specific uh, questions for, you know, in relation to specific cities. So we have a question that we combine between uh, Nassim Achi and Lichia. 
thank you, a general question. To what extent were the municipalities of these cities involved in decision-making for control of spread of the pandemic in these cities? What were their roles? Another question, which is general, and you can pick one of them, please. Thank you very much for this very nuanced talk. Great way to learn from elsewhere. Um, I think they also apply in London, where there is a local informal economy. Uh, this means that big food uh, retailers like Libby, Sainsbury, and Okado are gaining uh, oligopolistic status and main cater for the middle class. I was wondering which town, Jerusalem or Belfast, can be transposed to local government here in London to find alternative solutions to local informal economy closures. So I will stop with this question and let's see if we are lucky, maybe we could have uh, another one. Anyone who wants to answer the question, feel free to wave and I will unmute you. Andy, would you like? Yes, please. Um, I'll have a go just in relation to um, the first question and, and I'll think about the second as I'm speaking for the first. Um, I think that um, what you'll see in somewhere like South Africa has been um, an, an element whereby you have these nested hierarchies of governance that have kind of worked synergistically together. So you have national government, you have provincial government, and then you have city government. And what we've seen in relation to the cities themselves is they put in place measures to try and mitigate um, infection spread, sometimes successfully, sometimes in the context of South Africa, um, problematically. Um, we've seen, for example, in Cape Town as well, and something that I alluded to in my talk I didn't have time to say, was that the way in which the city of Cape Town itself has dealt with the homeless question, um, which is a significant challenge in South African cities, has been to create a, um, a particular camp area in the Mitchell's Plain area of the city to house up to 2,000 homeless individuals. Now, various human rights organizations have gone in there and, um, and, and highlighted that, 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 that the situation there is not conducive to actually minimizing COVID-19 spread, and that it's also potentially in abuse of, um, of various human rights statutes. It should be pointed out though, and this was some other questions I've seen noted on the Q&A, that um, it should be pointed out that South Africa and Cape Town in particular have particular histories of dealing with these types of crises. Cape Town, particularly because of the water crisis it had a couple of years ago, and also South Africa generally because of the HIV crisis. And so what you've seen is that those levels of expertise and those levels of knowledge have meant that because of the water crisis in the city, Cape Town itself has been tremendously reactive at dealing with a new crisis. And South African general public health officials, because of their expertise in HIV and TB, have been very effective at engaging with the state. And the fact it's been a science-led agenda, um, I think, is testament to that. Great. Uh, thank you, Andy. Any other panelists who wants to contribute to this question? Rania, yes, please. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, for us, the municipalities uh, did not take a major role in decision making uh, in regards to the lockdown and the measures to uh, limit the spread of the coronavirus, but um, they've taken uh, um, they've taken a different role in supporting uh, the people that live in those areas, um, especially the more vulnerable. And because Cyprus is small and communities are small, um, the municipalities have worked with um, NGOs uh, in order to provide for, for the vulnerable. I think they had a, more of a role there than in the actual uh, decisions on how to uh, limit the spread of the, of the virus. Um, there was another question, if I can say a couple of words, that there was a question about how the vulnerable and the lower social classes were protected with the, lockdown, with the extensive lockdowns in cities where we have extensive lockdowns. And I think um, to that, I, I have to say that unlike South Africa, we have been through a lot of crises in, in Cyprus, but with uh, our level of preparedness in dealing with crisis hasn't 
uh, improved that much, I have to say. It, um, but um, one thing that uh, I think uh, we've learned a bit because of the recent economic crisis, uh, I think uh, our ministries that relate uh, to uh, labor and also to uh, finances, they were a little bit more prepared. So our Ministry of Labor and Social Insurance managed to provide support to employees so that people did not, did not lose their jobs. So uh, all the business, businesses that went in lockdown, uh, they provided 60% of the salaries of people who were um, in those businesses and they paid them within a month. So that was something that was very quick. And I said, um, it was a good response from the government. Great, thank you, Urania. Uh, Dominic or Rami, uh, you can also pick something from the question box if you want. Yes, Dominic. We cannot hear you. Um, I see there's a there's a question being asked about how how much the divisions, uh, political divisions, affected yeah. the response of the Northern Ireland government. And again, I mean, I'm worried because it's very early days to start really analysing how they did it. I think, I think classically in this sort of case, I think there was, I think there was a lot of rhetoric about from nationalist uh, politicians about how we ought to uh, be be copying what they're doing in Dublin and unionist governments saying, oh, this is a UK uh, response. I've got a sneaking suspicion that underneath that, that the, the, because the differences between the Irish and British responses is really not that great, if, if I'm to be honest. They, they, they love publicizing how they've gone into lockdown a few days before we have and why aren't we doing it? I suspect at a lower level, we will find the differences aren't that great. But as ever, when you have, you have an ethnically divided society, the way you present that rhetoric to your group becomes import, important. And I think trying to separate, understand the rhetoric of difference from the actual difference is something that we'll have to analyze in the next mm -hmm. few months. Uh, great, thank you. Rami, any final words? Okay, I cannot see and hear Rami. Uh, I just want, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we have to wrap up and to, to, to close the discussion. I think it was fascinating and if to judge from the comments uh, on the chat and the comments in the Q&A, I think, you know, it was worth uh, having the time and discussing uh, the COVID-19 crisis in divided cities. Uh, I just want to share with you the information for our next event next week to be hosted by my colleague Andrea Rigon. Uh, it will take uh, place in the same day, but not the same time. It will be between two and three uh, in the afternoon. So please follow the news and register. I would like to thank especially uh, Kurat uh, and Alex, my colleagues from the DPU, that without them, I wouldn't survive this event today, I must say. So thank you very much, everyone, and I hope to see you next week.